welcome back to the stage, Ian Rayner. Wasn't that one of the great talks? I mean, oh, that, yeah. Wow. We've been doing this for 29 years. Our first big conference was in 1995, and I, I keep thinking, you know, surely it, we've hit all the landmarks, but I was really wrong. I thought that was unbelievable, and if, if my recording, so I could turn it into a podcast, has failed, I'm going to shoot myself, but we'll see. Patrick is going to video this. Um, are you Facebooking it or live streaming it or what? No, I'm just recording it. Just recording it. Um, so you'll have a chance to watch it and spread it. Anyway, um, I'm going to welcome back Ian Rankin and the marvelous James Salas, who has agreed to come and talk to Ian. Uh, Jim has a new, has the most recent book over at the signing table called Will Not. He is a poet, a musician, as some of you now know, a novelist, and a teacher, an extraordinary teacher, who is, I think, embarking Jim on a new class at ASU. Probably sold out. In fact, it is sold out, because I looked at it. So we're, we're just so pleased that Jim lives in Scottsdale, and, or in Phoenix, and is able to come and join us every once in a while. So please welcome James Salas and Ian Rankin. searching for the same experiments that happened again and again. But Ian, when you, when you wrote that, were, were you anticipating that would be, is it 21, 20, 21 books about Dr's character? That even crossed your mind? Uh, no, I mean, none of that crossed my mind at the time. I was just um, sort of thrilled to be published. My very first book was called The Flood, and was not a crime novel. It was a novel, it was a cool dudes romance. It was a novel about a young guy growing up in the village where I grew up and dreaming of escape. Um, and very heavily featured real people, most of my family. And that got me into quite a lot of trouble in uh, my hometown. My, I grew up in a town called Carton Den. In the book it was called Cars Den. I thought no one will ever know. <laughs> Everybody knew. Uh, so read this kind of a, almost as a reaction to that. And, I thought no one will see me in, the, in this 40-year-old alcoholic cop. Um, but it was meant to be one book, and in fact, first draft at the end, he dies. Uh, he's shot and killed at the end of Nuts and Crosses, and for some reason, second draft, I thought, well, maybe he, maybe he lives. And uh, so that gave me the opportunity a few books later to bring him back. But the first book, Nuts and Crosses, was no success. Didn't win any awards, wasn't shortlisted, didn't sell any copies, sold a few hundred copies. So I went off and did spy novels, and I did one spy novel, thinking I was wanting to be John Le Carre. And I did one big fat thriller, thinking I wanted to be a big fat thriller writer, who would be sold at airports. Neither of those sold, sold anything either. And my editor said, look, what happened to that guy, Rebus? I liked him as a character. And I thought, yeah, me too. So I brought him back for book two after a slight hiatus. And he just refused to leave after that because he had become a very useful way for me to look at the world and a very useful voice for me to hide behind. He could say things that I could never say in public. You know, he's, uh, he's much more of a maverick than I am. And he doesn't mind upsetting people. I, I mind terribly upsetting people. 
that through Rebus I can say all manner of things and get away with it. Um, so there was never an intention for him to stick around, but I'm glad he did. Well, you know, one of the things that first attracted me to uh, ministries or to the novels or whatever you want to call them is that they really are a vehicle uh, for just about anything you want to do. You, but you have the framework in place, and anything can go over that framework that you want. I think, you know, you might want to talk a little bit about the difference between European novels and American mysteries or something, but the fascinating thing is that there's a gravity to the genre fiction, whether you're writing crime fiction, science fiction, or fantasy, that continually sort of draws you down and makes it more and more formulaic. And I think as writers, we're always struggling against that. And you see this again and again with the Shual and Walu, who uh, really started the whole murder thing, and with uh, Jean Patrick Manchette in France, who absolutely re revolutionized crime writing. And we saw that here, of course, in the 30s, uh, at the same time that America was becoming an urban society. We were inventing this American detective novel, which is now sort of spread over the world like a cancer. But, <laughs> but do you think there is a difference between the European sensitivity and the American? Uh, well, there are diff definitely differences in the genre. I mean, the American crime novel focused a lot on the private detective, the private eye, and the private eye was came out of that sort of cowboy thing almost of being kind of the stranger, the charismatic stranger who rides into a lawless town and brings um, chaos, uh, you know, makes chaos and manages to bring about order which is what Jack Reacher still does. He's very much in that mold. But that in itself comes from a European tradition, which is the kind of knight. The kind of knight who goes off on a quest to save a damsel in distress, which is, you know, what happens in the first Chandler novel. Um, you know, uh, his detective Marlowe was originally going to be called Mallory, in homage to Mallory, uh, who wrote Lord Darthur, the poem. And you've got this guy who goes into the, what's it, Stern Wood is the name of the family. He goes to the Stern Wood to rescue a damsel in distress. Um, and he meets dragons along the way, the gangsters who are him. So it's very much based on uh, the English pastoral, the English uh, myth of the, or uh, I call it English, it's kind of Arthurian uh, legend of the knights going off and doing things. And Chandler was educated in England. He was educated at a very nice, expensive school in London. and he had, he was steeped in the classics. He knew exactly what he was doing with that character and with that genre. Um, so I think there was a seriousness to what he was doing that isn't always recognised. In the UK, it, was, it tended to be um, slightly bumbling Belgian <laughs> private detectives and, uh, and spinsters. <laughs> um, upper middle class women, uh, Miss Marple and her uh, ilk. Solving crimes in, in villages, as if villages in England were full of murder. <laughs> uh, and you know, if Miss Marple came to your door because you were her nephew and you opened the door, you go, shit, I'll be dead by chapter three. <laughs> <laughs> um, some, some obscure poison, or I'll be found dead in a billiard table. Um, and you know, I, would, I think the American novel, of course, as Chandler said himself, was a reaction against that to get back to the main streets, to make it urban, to make it gritty, to deal with the kind of issues that he felt were actually happening in contemporary society. Um, so, yeah, that was different. But I, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit because, I, I, you know, I was talking earlier about how I started off writing, I think I mentioned it in passing, I started off writing poetry and short stories. When I was at high school and when I went to university, I was writing poetry and short stories. I thought I was going to be a poet. And we spoke about Muriel Spark earlier. Muriel Spark always thought of herself as a poet first and a novel second. And uh, last, towards the end of last year, I went to her grave which is in, um, it's outside a town called Arezzo in, in Italy. And in the little village uh, churchyard, there's the grave of Muriel Spark, and it just says in it, Muriel Spark Poeta. Oh, no. That's all it says, Muriel Spark Poet. Um, and you, also, poet, come crime. So what is it about poets and, 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 and crime fiction? What, what takes us to the dark side? Because I'm very jealous of poets. I'm very jealous that a poet can do in a, in a phrase, a couplet, a line when it takes me 350 pages a uh, We're lazy. That's the <laughs> Novelists are lazy. <laughs> no, I think we are. You know, uh, the, the, the standing joke in my students is I say I really always wanted to just be a short story writer or a poet. And um, someone will pipe up and ask, well, do you, do you still write short stories? And one of the other students who's been with me for a while says, well, yes, as a matter of fact, that he publishes them as novels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, the, the Chandler, uh, you know, Chandler, I think, made the statement about Hammond that he, he took murder away from the manor houses and gave it back to the people who actually committed. And that was a very important part. And to go back a little bit further, uh, and I think uh, many of us feel that the, the, one of the huge differences between the European novel and the American novel for the mystery and crime is that the European novel is the novel proper is about man or woman finding his or her place in society, whereas the American novel is more descended from the romance, which is what you were saying, in which uh, the, the protagonist is generally set against society. He, uh, you know, as you said, he rides in on the wild horse and takes care of everything and then immediately retreats and goes back out to the frontier. And the interesting thing in America is we run out of the frontier and we're not really sure what we're supposed to do and where those bad places are now because they're everywhere. That's true. I mean, then in, in France, the, um, the American crime novel, uh, the therapists were taken very seriously, the therapists and forwards were taken very seriously because it happened to coincide, interesting, it happened to coincide with the rise of existentialism. And they saw a lot of these privatized as existential heroes. They were sort of making their own rules. Um, they were sort of finding a structure for, for living. Um, they were solving mysteries, which of course philosophers try and do all the time, about human nature, about the, about the human condition, and all crime fiction. I think all crime fiction is predicated on a very simple question, which is why do we human beings keep doing terrible things to each other? Basically, that's it. Um, and we try, and we ask that question again and again and again, and we don't get very close to an answer. A few years ago now, um, I, I was asked to front a documentary series on evil. Actually, it's got a documentary series on crime and punishment, not the book, but the actual acts. And we thought, and as I talked to the producer, we thought we can't do that without actually answering a bigger question, which is about good and evil. And um, so, so we, we spent months going around the world. Um, I came to the States and went to death row in Texas and interviewed a guy who'd been on death row for 10 years. Uh, went to the Vatican and was exorcised by the chief exorcist of the Diocese of Rome, Father Gabriele Mort. And the director of The Exorcist a few years ago made a documentary, it's on Netflix, about this guy, The Devil and Father of Mort, I think the documentary is called. Um, so he exorcised me. And we spent months doing this and talking to historians about, you know, terrible crimes that happened during uh, World War II and, and uh, history and all of that. And at the end of the series, Sadly for me, I was not much further forward. I could point an action and say that was an act of evil, but to point an individual and say that person is irredeemably evil was much harder for me. Um, and there was just one exception to that, and it was a, it was a couple of serial killers in, in the UK who operated in the early 60s, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, and they killed kids, tortured them, taped them, and recorded them. And Brady, who was insane, um, outlived Myra Hindley and was in this, this asylum for the criminally insane. Um, and the producer of this program that we're making this series got in touch with Brady's mum, without my knowledge, and said, can we interview you about it, what it's like to be Ian Brady's mother? She passed it on to Brady himself, and he wrote back to the producer and said, no, no, Mr. Rankin comes to this asylum and talks to me. And the producer got very excited about this. And I said, there's no bleeping way that I am going to sit in a room with Ian Brady because this guy is a player of games. He's not, a, he's not an unintelligent man. He spent his whole life in incarceration playing psychological games. And once he's inside my head, he's not coming out. I can't unmeet him. So that was an act of moral cowardice on my part. As a novelist, I should have taken that meeting, probably. But I didn't want to, so I didn't do it. I get heard an interview recently with Ben Kingsley talking about the uh, plan to grow a Viking, and he says many, or echoes many of the things you've just said, is uh, they were saying, well, did, did you recreate this person? Was this person in your head? He said, no, I was very careful to keep this person out of my head. And he said, I treated it as though I were a painter. I come into the studio, I put my smock on, I lay out my brushes and, and my paints, and I would do my job, and then I would put all that away and go home. And I thought that is such a sane way of looking at it, but at the same time, this is keep going back to that same pool and dipping into it. Adolf Eichmann, 
I don't like him in the film. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting because Muriel Spark, I mean, those of you who are fans of Muriel, and might be one or two in the room, wrote a novel called The Mandelbaum Gate, which featured the Eichmann trial. Because he was sort of um, abducted by the Israelis and taken uh, back to Israel and put on trial. And Spark was actually there visiting Israel while the trial was going on. And I think she went along to, to one day of the trial. I think she was actually there in the room while he was being um, asked by the prosecutor various questions. Mm. So it's extraordinary that he should really set that conversation we're having. And again, then comes Muriel Spark and then back into my life. Well, Ian, I, why don't you talk a little bit about Muriel Spark? Because I think many of us, we, we were lamenting that nobody knows her. Nobody talks about her here in, in the States, which is very, very sad. Well, I mean, she wrote, she wrote very short novels, and that's not very fashionable these days. Um, and, but they were very morally complex books. She wrote very well about monsters. Miss Jean Brody, this teacher who's in the front of Miss Jean Brody, you're never sure, even by the end, that she was the hero or the villain of that story. Very true. Because she had an interesting effect on the girls she was teaching. Um, she would try and mold them to be like her, um, or to do things that she was able to do, um, such as have affairs with her teachers, etc., etc. Or go and fight for. She tried to get one girl to go and fight uh, for the for the fascists in Spain, yeah. um, and she was a great uh, believer in Mussolini, and she was heavily based on her, on Muriel Sparks' own teacher, Miss Kay. Miss Kay uh, taught at Muriel Sparks School and taught Muriel and she, she went to Italy and came back and she was telling all her girls how wonderful Mussolini was. She would put up pictures of Giotto paintings, her favourite artists and all that and it's all in the film and it's all in the book. Very, and, and she eventually, mysterious, well, I know this because I made a documentary with Muriel Spark earlier this year which is going to be shown on TV in the UK later this year. Um, uh, Miss Kay mysteriously disappeared from the school, or was kicked out of the school, during World, quite early on in World War II. And it's got to be because she was a fascist. It's got to be that, you know, her standing up for people like Mussolini and Hitler, she was never going to get to be a teacher in those circumstances. So she disappeared from the story of that school um, in, during World War II. But the, the great thing about Spark for me is she was a poet, and these books are, are distilled. So although they might only be 120 pages long, you can read them and reread them and reread them your whole life and get new information from them all the time. She writes well about wartime and the immediate aftermath of the war in London. She was born in Edinburgh, um, half Jewish, uh, went to Scottish Presbyterian school, um, married a Jewish guy, went to Rhodesia as it was in Africa <clears throat> just before World War II. She hadn't married the right guy, and so she eventually fled back to the UK and worked um, in the kind of uh, secret service. She had a very lowly role in the secret service to do with misinformation, trying to send decoy radio shows to the Germans, making the Germans believe they were listening to a German radio show, but it was actually a UK radio show telling them to lay down their weapons and stuff. And, and she would walk the German prisoners who were helping in that, language-wise, she would walk them around to the, the, the area and stuff. And then she wrote this book um, uh, in which that all happens, you know, in which there's a character uh, who, uh, it's called Hot House by the East River, in which that all happens, and the character's very heavy with Edward Eastman. She went, then went and was the secretary of the Poetry Society in the 50s in London, and she was writing poetry at this time. She was trying to bring up a kid on her own. She was uh, taking a lot of appetite suppressants, dexedrine, speed, so, so she wouldn't eat, and that started giving her hallucinations. And her first novel was about someone who suffered from hallucinations, and thinks she's a character in a novel. So it was actually postmodernism, but it was in the early 50s, so it was almost before postmodernism was a thing. Um, so she had this extraordinary series of events which all drip fed into her novels. And, um, before you arrived earlier, I was talking a little bit about The Driver's Seat, which is one of my favourites, which again is a very short book, but very powerful why done it rather than who done it, in a way, um, that, that pushes at the barriers of crime fiction and what crime fiction can and can't do. But all her books are worth reading, all of them. And uh, she had a very long, and towards the end of her life, a happy life. But I mean, when, when fame came, which it did, The New Yorker, New Yorker magazine published Miss Jean Brody in a single issue. Oh. I've actually got the magazine at home, it was 140 pages or something, and it, it was the entire text 
And I'd only even said it was written by Muriel Spar, or maybe her name was in Tiny Writing at the end. But, the, but they, they also published, I think, The Driver's Seat as well. And they published her, a lot of her films. And that became a worldwide hit. And the film, of course, and the play were a big hit. And she then, she moved to New York for a while, then she moved to Rome. And she liked luxury, she liked spending money on clothes and jewellery. Richard Taylor and Elizabeth, uh, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor would, would visit, and various, you know, um, titled heads of Europe would visit and stuff, and that. And she loved all that, but at her heart, she never really left Scotland. All her books have a certain sense of like any Scottish identity to them, um, as well as being influenced by the border ballads and the supernatural. She introduces Scottish characters into the books and Scottish phrases, and just her sense of sensibility to me, seems very Scott. Yeah, I think one of, one of the problems with, with, uh, with her is that the, the books are so vastly different one from another, and I think that that keeps uh, keeps her from developing that following. Where I'm looking for more of the sausage I had the last time I was in here. Uh, but the books are extremely... I mean, that's a, that's a huge problem for crime writers, right? Yeah. It's a big problem. I mean, how do you keep a series fresh? We've had this question asked a few times during this weekend. Oh, he's talking about himself again. Okay. Yeah, really. <laughs> Talking about how crime writers keep a series fresh. I could be talking about your characters as well, as much as mine. And that is a huge, huge problem. And, and you know, with 21 books, what, how, how do you do that? You know, it's, you started with a, a fairly simple book. And by the time you got to the books that are uh, based on uh, Rolling Stones songs, uh, they were getting more and more complicated with multi layers of uh, multiple stories going on. And, you know, it was, how much of that is just true? keep yourself entertaining and amused and challenge yourself. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if you're writing about the same character or the same set of characters in the same city in contemporary times, you want to, yeah, you, you don't want to keep repeating yourself. You want to try and keep it fresh and you, you want to um, be excited about what you're writing next. So you try and push yourself a little bit harder to make the story more complex, more morally complex and twistier. Um, to introduce elements that maybe weren't in the early books where you were learning the trade. I was very lucky that I was published at a time when you were allowed to learn the trade. I wasn't making my publisher in the UK any money at all for the first five, six, seven, eight, nine books. Wow. I didn't hit the New York Times bestseller list until Rebus novel number 19. Wow. By which time I'd written about 25 books. <laughs> um, I joke it's because you have to sell fewer books these days to get to the New York Times bestseller list. Um, but, you know, and, and I decided that Rebus would live in real time, uh, or an approximation of real time. So that meant when I approach a new book, he's changed. Physically, he's changed. He's got older, he's got slower. Um, his eyesight isn't what it was. His hearing isn't what it was. As he said, or as, as, as a, a wise man once said, I think it was Leonard Cohen, he aches in the places where he used to play. And this is all imagination, <laughs> of course, on his part. Yeah, no, really he isn't. Nothing about it it really is. isn't. Um, so, you know, so during the course of his career in the books, he has retired. He's no longer a cop. Um, he's having trouble climbing the two flights of stairs to his apartment. He's got COPD, which used to be called emphysema, um, as a result of his smoking and his terrible uh, drinking and, and not taking any exercise and eating nothing but fried food. So, so he, he, you know, in, in later books, I've got some fun with that because he tries to kick down a door and he limps for the rest of the book. <laughs> <laughs> People are, he's going to get in a fight with somebody, he goes, hang on, I'm probably going to lose this fight, I better not do that. Um, whereas in the early books, he was very physical, he would use his, his heft to intimidate people. It doesn't work anymore when you're in your mid to late 60s. And he's not a cop. So he goes into the police stations now, and the person at the front desk goes, yes, can I help you, sir? <laughs> and he goes, well, I used to work here. So? Well, I just want to go upstairs and see the CID. I don't think so. You know, so, he's, so that gives me new challenges. And that keeps the series fresh, and that keeps me excited about the characters. Because all these barriers, they go, well, how, how, how can I get this, this guy in his 60s, who's no longer a cop, how can I realistically get him involved in a crime investigation? So I've got to find ways to do that. And, um, and that's a lot of fun at the moment. And it's, and, and it's fun sort of putting these, throwing these challenges back to Rebus. Okay, how are you going to get past the front desk? How are you going to inveigle your way into a crime investigation? You know, how are you going to get past the front desk at the mortuary or whatever? Yeah, and the poor man tries to retire and you won't let him. He doesn't want to retire. He's not, he's not trying to go. I would love it if he settled down and opened a bed and breakfast or something. But he always uh, wants to take over, right? Yeah, I would love it, but he won't. He won't. He's a, he's a cop. He's a detective to, the, to, very, to his very soul. And he hates being retired. 
he still feels useful. He wants to be feel useful in the world. There's this kind of parallel storyline that runs now. Cafferty, the villain, the gangster who runs Edinburgh, also retired, came back, decided he didn't like being retired anymore. He didn't like these young, more venal villains and gangsters coming along and taking his territory, so he fought back and pushed back. Him and Rebus have got the same situation. They are men of a certain age, looking around in growing bewilderment in the world, and saying to themselves, do we still make a difference? Do we still have a role to play? Whereas the world is saying to them, look, it's time to shuffle off. It's time to go and open your bed and breakfast. It's time to retire, put your feet up. And they're going, then we lose any meaning. The only meaning our lives have are these roles we've given ourselves. So in, in, in one sense, they're, they're sort of looking around and seeing what's there and, and, and wondering about it. On the other hand, they're sort of living in the past. We're trying to bring the past into the present. And with uh, rather than the devil, we sort of end with this. Uh, he's unable to retire. He gets into the cold cases for that. And it ends, as I recall, with that, sort of sitting back. And, and following this is the book he has here, which I hope he's going to read from a bit now. Nice segue. It's almost like a pro, I tell you. Yeah, I, I brought a copy of um, In a House of Lies with me. It's a, it's a proof copy, it's not a finished copy. I've not seen a finished copy yet. The reason it's with me is not to read out to you, but I thought it'd be nice to maybe do it. I've got to take it to VoucherCon, because there's a woman at VoucherCon, uh, one of the volunteers, and she paid money to charity to be in the book. Oh. Oh. In fact, she didn't. She paid money to be in the previous book, and I forgot. <laughs> So the last time I did an American tour, she came to me and she said, and it was uh, Rather Be the Devil, she said, is this the book I'm in? And I went, excuse me? And she went, I paid money to charity to be in this book. I went, shit, I forgot. Uh, I, I do it four or five times a book, four or five times per book, I put real people in who've paid charity to be in there. And it's, I have a lot of fun with it, I have a lot of fun with it. Anyway, so Aubrey Hamilton, Aubrey Hamilton is in this book as a forensic uh, pathologist, I think. Um, so that's why I've got the book with me, is to hand it over to her and say, you finally made it into a real book. It's a lot of fun. I mean, somebody paid for the cat to be in the book. Uh, no, this one, the previous book, their cat was called Boethius. They sent me an entire psychological profile of their cat. Oh my god! Oh my god. A photograph of their cat. So it would be their cat, it would just be a cat. At least it wasn't an autobiography of the cat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go a slight tangent. You might have heard this before if you've heard me speak before, because I've told this story before at, uh, at Barbara's store. Um, but my favourite one was a, 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 it was a charity in London, and they emailed me and said, OK, we've got a winner. You've got to get in touch with him. I said, okay, who's the winner? He's called Peacock Johnson. Like, what? So I looked at this guy's website. He had a website. He looked really dodgy. He said he was wearing Elvis Vegas shades, hair slicked back, Hawaiian shirt. Uh, I'm like, what? And he was talking about his barely legal business empire with his friend We Evil Bob. Or what? So I got in touch with him. I said, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with you, pal. Like, uh, he got back, he said, look, I don't care, good guy, bad guy, but just can we evil Bob in it as well? <laughs> so I needed a gun runner, someone who's selling guns illegally. I thought, this is perfect, he's perfect. This will be Peacock Johnson, and his henchman, his sidekick, will be we evil Bob. Wrote the book, which was called A Question of Blood. Loved it, I loved writing about the characters. So I got in touch and said, I really enjoyed writing about you, can I write about you again? Uh, email bounced back. Looked at his website, no longer exists. I went, what? So I turned detective. Now at this um, charity event, a band were playing, a Glasgow band called Bell and Sebastian, and their bassist is a notorious practical joker. Oh. So I got in touch and said, oh. anything I should know? He went, yep, it's me. Oh. He invented this character, he invented all the stuff online, and then he oh. bought the right to be in the book. I said, well, I loved writing about Peacock Johnson. Maybe I'll write about it again. He went, no can do. I said, why? He said, because now I'm going to write a book about Peacock Johnson. <laughs> and he did, and it's online, you can read it for free. You can go online, I think it's called Peacock's Tale or something. Anyway, in this, in, yeah, I know. In, this, in this book, uh, a small town Glasgow crook called Peacock Johnson is framed for murder. He runs home to his wife, and he says, what the hell am I going to do? And she's watching an episode of Rebus on TV. <laughs> and she says, go to Edinburgh and see that guy. So he goes to Edinburgh and he goes to the Oxford bar and says, can I talk to Rebus, please? And they go, he's a fictional character. 
that Ian Rankin's in the back room. So he comes in, and the fictional Ian Rankin helps him clear his name. Oh. <laughs> I will now do a short read. Isn't that great? That is incredible. I'm just going to do the first couple of pages from this. <clears throat> this comes out in the, in the States right at the end of this year. The car was found because Ginger was jealous of his friend Jimmy. There were four of them in the woods that morning. It was the February break, no school for a few days. They'd taken our bikes as far as they could, then left them when the path became too overgrown with roots and fallen branches suddenly forming a makeshift assault course. All four of them were 11 years old and in the same class. Ginger, Alan, Rick, and Jimmy. Jimmy's bike was the most expensive. His stuff always was. Clothes, backpack, bike. His parents always bought the best. His bedroom was stuffed with game consoles and the latest releases, which was why Ginger waited till Jimmy was standing at the very edge of the deep gully, sweating and panting after all that running and jumping they'd been doing, before giving him a shove. There wasn't much force to it. Ginger had intended that Jimmy would get a fright, maybe slide a few feet down the slope, but be able to claw his way back without help, while the rest of them laughed and watched and filmed. But the sides were steep and unstable, and Jimmy tumbled and skidded all the way down, falling into the mass of bracken, briar, and nettles at the bottom. I didn't do it, Ginger said, this being his default position in classroom, playground, and the house he shared with his parents and two sisters. Alan was cursing under his breath as he peered over the edge. Rick had a hold of the back of Alan's hoodie, as if fearing that Ginger wasn't yet finished. I didn't do it, Ginger repeated more loudly. All three of them watched as Jimmy got to his feet. He checked the backs of his hands for nettle stings, then his face, before reaching down for a severed branch. He's coming for you, Alan teased Ginger. But Jimmy was using the branch to prod at the bracken, swishing it aside as best he could, until they could all see what was hidden there. Somebody dumped a car, Jimmy called up to him. Cars get dumped all the time, Rick commented. You okay to climb out of there? But Jimmy ignored him. He was moving around the car, doing his best to uncover it. The windows were still intact, but covered in a mossy film. He tugged his sleeve over his hand and started wiping. The other boys looked at each other. Alan was the first to start scrambling down the gradient, Rick and Ginger following his lead. Anything worth taking? Alan inquired. Jimmy's face got close to the glass. He tried the driver's side door, but it was jammed. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, the American side, I mean, I'm thinking of what a perfect setup for whatever's going to follow, but I'm a poet, and as I was listening, and I hope as you were, you were hearing stresses, you were hearing rhythms of the language, mm -hmm. and that's what really, really makes uh, Ian's writing come alive for me. Uh, and I'm not even sure how intentional it is, but I was sitting here going this way because there is wow. such a rhythm to the language. And part of that is where he's from, and part of it is just him being in touch with, with what he's writing. We were talking the other night you know, about your new play, your, which is in rehearsal now. Can you talk uh, about that a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, was, uh, I did one play a few years ago for the Lyceum Theatre in Edinburgh. I co-wrote it with a, a director. Um, it was called Dark Road, and it was about a, um, a senior cop on the edge of retirement, and a case that had been, she felt needed some closure. Um, it wasn't Rebus, it, uh, it was a brand new story written for the stage, but it wasn't Rebus. But then last year, a producer got in touch with me and he said, I would love to see Rebus on the stage. He said, I don't want to see a book though, I don't want to try and, it's very difficult to take a book and translate it to anything. Film, TV, play, very difficult. He said, can we get a brand new story? So I sat down with another playwright called Rona Munro, a fantastic playwright, and we talked about Rebus for a while. And we talked about the macho culture in which he had grown up. We talked about the aging process. Uh, we talked about the notion of unfinished business with Cafferty, the gangster. And we basically workshopped a story that we felt would, could only work on stage. That would work on stage. It, was, it could only be told on the stage. And yeah, and wrote draft after draft after draft, and it's now been cast, and the actors are in rehearsal in Birmingham, in England, and it opens in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then it comes to Edinburgh, then it tours around the UK, maybe it'll come to the States, who knows. 
after that. Um, and what, what attracted me was the notion of me finally getting to be in the same room as Rebus, in three dimensions. I've always avoided Rebus on television. And I always said the reason I avoided it on television was because I didn't want actors, uh, actors' mannerisms and vocal inflections to get in the way of my guy, to get in the way of the character who's existed in my head for 30 years. I don't see that being a problem on the stage for some reason. I don't see it being a problem in the same way because I think you'll be so, that this action between these two huge characters, Rebus and Caffrey, I think will just be so amazing. Uh, if the performances are right, if the, if, the, if the performance, the actors get it right, I think it'll be extraordinary. And even thinking about it, the hair's actually going up on my arms. Um, so I thought it'd be lovely to see it. You know, it'd be lovely to see Rebus on stage in 3D, not the kind of slightly lazy thing you get on television. The thing about television is they take a 400 page novel and they throw it away. And they keep the title. Yeah. And then they make up a story that will shoehorn in to 46 minutes. They, I mean, a Rebus novel on TV is 46 minutes, of, so it's a 46 page script. And you know, there's no way you can take a, a Rebus novel and turn it to 46 pages. So they throw away all the good stuff. And because this has been specifically written for the stage, we've thrown away none of the good stuff. All the good stuff is there in the dialogue. Um, of course it's driven by the dialogue. And I love writing dialogue. Uh, as you've talked about rhythm, I just love the rhythm of dialogue, and especially with Rebus. There's a cadence, there's a, there's a humor that undercuts some of the seriousness of what's going on, and then the seriousness undercuts the humor as well. Um, and it's all about what the, it's not always about what the characters are saying, it's about what they're not saying. When Rebus and Caffrey are talking to each other, you shouldn't be listening to what they're saying. You should be kind of listening to what they're not, what's not being said between them. And I love that. I love the fact that they're holding back information from us and their true feelings from us. We've got to try and interpret and intuit that. Um, and, and I enjoy being part of that process, and I enjoy readers enjoying that process. Well, I, I always tell my students that, that uh, the, the dialogue, when you're writing a dialogue, it's, it's not two people talking. It, it's much more than that, because uh, everyone has his or her own agenda, and they are not talking about the important things, they're talking around those things or towards those things. What you said about not wanting to see I mean, is, is really interesting, because you don't, describe characters very often. You want the, the reader to come in and make that character, and it, it, there's a lot of static when you see that character up there, and you think, oh my god, you know, it's engraved in my mind now. Yeah, I mean, there are things you can do as a writer that will give you a sense of character. I mean, for example, Rebus is interested in music. I know we're both passionate about music in our personal lives anyway, but I gave Rebus, um, um, a, he became a fan of music because I thought it's a really it's a good way of telling you, the reader, a lot about him without me actually having to spread it on with a trowel. So, you know, you can tell roughly his age, his social class, that he's a bit of a loner, he's not a party animal. You can tell all of that by the stuff he listens to when he goes back to his apartment at the end of the evening. He's listening to Leonard Cohen, he's listening to blues stuff like Rory Gallagher, <laughs> the Stones. He prefers the Stones to the Beatles, so probably in his... Um, when he was a kid, he thought of himself as a bit of a rebel, a bit of a maverick, so you get that sense of him as well. Um, you get all of that from his musical choices. I don't have to lay it out, I don't have to give you a paragraph of description of this guy, because him putting a record on the turntable has done it for me. And I really, I really enjoy that. And also the thing about writing about music is, unlike the man sitting next to me, I have no musical ability whatsoever. But because the books are so heavily infused with music, musicians have become fans of the books. And because musicians have become fans of the books, I've become friendly with them, and I've been able to work with them. And a few years ago, there was a Scottish musician called Jackie Levin. He's not very, very well known. He died a couple of years ago. I'd written, in one of the Rebus novels, I'd written Rebus listening to a Jackie Levin album. I didn't know Jackie was a fan of the books. He's on tour in Sweden. He opens a new book up, and he goes, bloody hell, that's me. <laughs> so he got in touch with my publisher. They put us in touch with each other. We ended up working together. We did a show called Jackie Levin Said, uh, which was a 40 minute short story by me touching on themes he talks about and it wasn't a crime story but talking about themes he touches on his songs um, to do with masculinity and loss and everything else and he did he wrote some songs that would reflect back on that story we took it on tour it was recorded as an album so for a week or two i could go into a record store and find my album in the <laughs> that i'd made yay and then because we because we uh had made an album i had to go on tour and he phoned me he said ian what do you want on your rider 
I said, what the hell's a writer? He said, it's your backstage requirements as a musician. I went, I'm a writer, we're lucky if we get a jug of water. What are you talking about? I said, you're the, no, you're the musician, you do the writer, okay. So the first event is the Royal Festival Hall in London. Very wow. big, prestigious venue. I go to a dressing room the size of this room. It's just me and Jackie sharing this dressing room. And I look around, his side of the room, fresh towels, a, a mini bar, a mini fridge full of stuff. There's a huge bowls of fruit. There are chocolates and, and desserts and, and, and cookies. And there's, there's, there's cheese and there's this. And a bit like that lunch we just saw. Yeah. It was like that. And booze, 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 and soft drinks, mixers, you name it. My side of the room, nothing. <laughs> So I sat down, all right, Jackie? All right, all right, tune the guitar, bing, 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 bing. And then uh, a backstage member, is, a member of staff kicks in the door, holding something. He says, which one of you buggers asked for a haggis? <laughs> <laughs> Jackie just points at me. <laughs> and I saw the writer later on, and all I had on my side was, Mr. Rankin requires one uncooked haggis. <laughs> That was a fun tour. Yeah. See what fascinating lives we lead? <laughs> you know, I felt rather like that. My, my wife and I went to, uh, on, on the set when they were making the movie of Drive, and you know, as, as Ian says, as, as writers, no one really cares about us at all. So we, we drive outside in LA, and there's this, this, this stretch of a place. They've taken over an entire town, and it's as though an invading army moved in and there's food everywhere, and there's a huge, huge mess tent that can seat about three or 4,000. And you know, so for like three hours, we're part of all this, and nobody cares before or after, but it's very interesting. What you were saying about delineating character by what, what, what that character listens to, yeah. and these subtle ways of doing it, where the, where, the, the, where the person lives, what that place looks like what the car looks like that they get in. You know, you see this in Mary the Spark, and that's why the novels are so short. Everything is condensed, everything is subtle and indirect. And I try to inculcate that in, in students when I'm talking about writing. Uh, we were also talking last night uh, about your, your current investment as you are downsizing, and I think this is very interesting because it's, as writers, we will think it's a wonderful metaphor and we want to rush home and use this in something. It's also something that many of us oh, Stand back, man. I want to write about it. Stand back. Stand back. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my, my wife got, she, she, you know, yeah, my wife runs my life. And she decided we needed to downsize. Um, two of us rattling around in a big Victorian three story house in Edinburgh. So she decided we were going to move into a three bedroom apartment. So I thought, well, this stuff ain't fitting in a three bedroom apartment. So I've spent the last few months, um, yeah, just getting rid of stuff and sorting through stuff and going through a lot of paper. I mean, just 20, 30, 30 odd years of my life in paper form, because I kept everything. Reviews, bestseller lists, uh, interviews, letters from other writers, um, contracts, bank statements, receipts for meals in Rome when I've been on holiday, you know, all kinds of stuff I just kept. I had to go through it. There, I was lucky in a way, the National Library of Scotland said, we want your archive. So I thought, okay, but I've still got to go through it because there might be stuff I don't want them to see. <laughs> you know, you don't want students of the future seeing some of the stuff you wrote when you were young. Or some oh, of those new Polaroids. Yeah, that kind of thing. That's the thing. Yeah. When I was treading the grapes. And we were all, yeah, there's, there's photographs of that. There's photographs. We were all taking photographs in our little Polaroid cameras. Uh, yeah. I tell you. Um, so I had to go through the whole thing and it was fascinating. One of the sad things in a way was a lot of the correspondence, and it was correspondence that was in the era before email. And I was living in France, a lot of it was airmail letters, backwards and forwards, and a lot of the correspondence was with dead people. Yes. Michael Dibden, and Reginald Hill, oh. and Ruth Rendell, and uh, William McIlvaney, uh -huh. and Ian Banks, my dear departed friend, uh, and a bunch of people who are no longer there. I went, Jesus. You know, it was desperate. And I'd forgotten how long a correspondence I had actually had with Ian Banks. We'd, we'd written a lot of letters to, to each other. Um, so that's all going to the National Library of Scotland. Um, but yeah, the books, I've, I've said, oh geez, the charity shops of Edinburgh have been getting all my books. And uh, 
CDs and albums and stuff, I've got to put the list down. You, you start to think, what do I really need as opposed to what I've got? Um, but it's, so it's been a really cleansing, therapeutic experience. And maybe I'll get an essay for the New Yorker out of it. <laughs> you know, at the very least, I'd want to get an essay out of it, I would have thought. Um, but yeah, but the, the early stuff was interesting. I was finding short stories I didn't remember writing. I found scripts for TV shows that I would have made that I'd written. I had a comedy set in a supermarket. I had, honestly, no memory of it at all, but I'd like draft after draft after draft of this supposed TV venture I was going to do, which was a sitcom set in a supermarket. No memory of it at all. Um, you know, projects to get readers on television and film that never went anywhere. I had a meeting with Sean Connery uh, one time uh, about the possibility of him playing Rebus, but he felt he was too old to do it. Uh, yeah, if only I'd been 20 years younger. <laughs> um, um, every Scotsman can do an impression. Every, every Scotswoman can do an impression. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to talk about this on your own. Sure, yes, I, I was shaking. Did you do that? Did you do that? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been an interesting experience. I'm not quite finished yet. I mean, I'm not finished down some. We're not moved. We don't move till next spring. But the, uh, the, the boxes for the National Library of Scotland are already yeah. gone. 20, 20 big archive boxes are gone. And as far as I know, it's probably going to be the most complete archive they've got of writers live. Because I've seen some of the archives. They've got the book Muriel Spark archive, but it's only the last, the last 10 years of her life. They've got Willie McIlvanny's archive, but it's only a few boxes of manuscripts. Um, I don't know if they know what they're letting themselves in for with the Ian Rankin archive. I need a, need a truck to take it along with. And if they simply say, Ian, we don't want it, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Yeah, I have much the same experience. Uh, Tulane, uh, where I went to school, my brother went to school, uh, has my archive. And I, I know they had no idea what they were getting because, I, you know, I'm from an English major background in which all of this stuff is so important. So. I have receipts from, you know, bus fares from the 60s and, and you know, like airmail letters from when I lived in London and, and you know, most of us just young. Uh, but the, in, in some manner, being forced to go through all that is rather interesting because, uh, especially at my age, I tend to forget more and more things. <laughs> so I am sort of reliving my life, but so much of it is just absolute junk and so much of it is kind of scary. I'll tell you one thing they're not getting. I've got a big box of diaries. My sister for, for my Chris, Christmas or birthday when I was 11 or 12 gave me a little pocket diary. And I just filled it up. It felt you got to fill up every little bit of space. And, and then every year after that, she gave me a bigger and bigger diary. It was a diary and I felt I still got to keep filling up every little bit of space. And it's just rubbish. It's just rubbish. And all the girls I fancied at school and I'm writing poems to them, kind of go, oh. Um, you know, the records I would buy if I had any money, all that stuff. Visit my auntie, oh my god, all kinds of stuff. There's a, I don't know if you can find it, but if you can try and find this BBC radio programme called Dear Diary. It's a series they do on BBC radio, and I did it last year. It's like a celebrity goes through their teenage diary. No, it's called My Teenage Diary. And a celebrity goes through their teenage They said, said, just send us all your diaries and we'll go through it. I said, no, I'll pick out some juicy bits and you can, and you know, and it's just, it was an extraordinary thing to do, but the, nobody, those are going to be, they're either going to my coffin with me or they're going to be ceremonially burned. There's no way anybody's yet to see Ian Rankin from 1972 until about 1984. But some of the rejection stuff that's in there is amazing. You know, I'm sending stuff off to the BBC, you know, all the time, like uh, poems and short stories and stuff. None of it ever getting, never getting published. Um, and the first Rebus novel, I, I found the letter that I got from my agent at the time, uh, enlisting the seven publishers who turned it down at that point. So there was a Rebus 30th anniversary um, exhibition in Edinburgh last year, and I gave them that, they put that on display, shaming publicly all the publishers <laughs> that turned down Rebus. Uh, and it was sent, I think it was sent to seven or eight, and only the, the very last one on the list picked it up. Oh, and seven publishers. And to bring us back to the beginning before we open it up to questions, that was Muriel Sparks publisher. Oh. Towards, oh. towards the end of her life, she was published by The Bodily Head, who also published Graham Greene. And Graham Greene had been a big influence on Muriel Spark. He'd helped her out financially when she was poor and she was going through the, the, the druggy phase, taking dexaphine and stuff. He was helping her financially. He said the only thing was he never wanted to be thanked. Never wanted to be fined for doing it. So suddenly, 
the Rebus, first Rebus novel was published by Muriel Sparks publisher. Isn't that a nice way to end? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but we're going, to open up to, we're going to open up to questions. I think we've got time for a few. Barbara, got time for a few questions? Sure, sure says Barbara. In that case, we must have time. There's nothing left you want to know, is there? Yeah, Patrick, what? Yeah, and yeah, that wasn't recorded. Can you just do it all again? That's what you're about to say. <laughs> I, can, I can edit it. Um, can you say a few words about Derek Raymond? Was his, uh, his nameless detective guy any kind of influence on Rebus? This is a question about Derek Raymond, uh, who over here was known as Robin Cook. Yeah, his real name was Robin Cook. Other way around. He had to change his name because it was a thriller writer called Robin Cook. Um, bizarrely, it was also an MP, a Scottish MP called Robin Cook as well. Um, anyway, yeah, Derek Raymond, uh, he was a, a very dark Jacobean crime writer. Um, and I didn't come across him until I published the first Rebus novel, I think. I lived in London from 86 to 90. It was during that time I got to know him. First Rebus novel was 87, so it's just about possible that I'd met him before it was published, but he certainly was an influence in the first one. But that kind of gothic, um, hard brilliance of his writing, definitely, def I mean, everything influences the writer. Everything, I mean, Muriel Spark says this. Everything is, is material and it will get used eventually. And that notion of this, this, this nameless detective, he's a, he's a lowly, he's a detective sergeant, I think, which is what Rebus was in the first few books, um, who's on the kind of side of justice, he's got a moral code, but the world around him is very dark indeed. That was definitely, that kind of gritty sense of nighttime Edinburgh. I didn't have to stretch too far for nighttime Edinburgh to be gothic. It is. <laughs> you know, you walk down the streets of Edinburgh on a misty night, you would, especially the old time, you think, what, what century am I in? You know, you could as easily be in 1790 as the present day. Um, but I met him a few times in London. A bunch of us used to go out drinking together. And I mean, he was a complicated character. He was not an easy guy to get to know well. Um, uh, and in some ways, a dangerous person to be around in terms of his lifestyle. Uh, and if you had the same lifestyle as him, you'd be dead within a week or two. Um, he, uh, and he lived around Soho, which was quite a gritty, part of town at that time, it's all been cleaned up now, but it's still in the centre of porn and brothels and... Wasn't there a leather stuff. jacket story that you told me? Well, a friend of ours, a mutual friend, a guy called Mark Timlin, who was a crime writer, came into the bar one night and he said, I just got this leather coat. And I was like, oh yeah. And he said, uh, he said, I got it cheap. I said, why'd you get it cheap? He said, because it's got a knife, it's got a stab uh, hole in the back of it. He took it off and sure enough, it was this kind of two inch slit in the back of the coat. And Derek Raymond was there, it wasn't his coat, but he was there that night when Timlin came in with his coat with this kind of stab uh, marks in the back of it. I thought, yes, yeah, you got a good deal there, Mark. Yeah. Um, no blood, no sign of any blood, which is interesting, but definitely a stab, definitely a coat had been stabbed. But a bunch of us fairly disreputable people all hanging around Soho in the late 80s. Um, and we called ourselves New Blood, no, Fresh Blood. And we decided we weren't the old guard, we weren't the um, Ruth Rendell or the P.D. James School of Crime Writing. We were a new, more urban, grittier, more working class kind of crime fiction. There was Mark Timlin was part of that. And um, I think Philip Kerr was part of that group as well. And. Uh, Forget who else, Denise Danks, I think was possibly the only female member when we started, but there were more later on. And we just we just thought we were we were the new we were the new kids in the block and we were gonna take crime fiction in a exciting new direction. And because our publishers wouldn't promote us, we'd do it ourselves. And we printed up a little thing called the Fresh Blood, you know, mandate or something, and put it in the crime bookstore in London that Max and Jakubowski ran. And we just used to all pal around and get drunk. We would call those gangs here in Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, it felt like something was changing in, in English crime writing. Something was shifting. The tectonic plates were shifting. The old guard, the Colin Dexter with Inspector Morse, the Reg Hill with Yellen Pasco, the, the Ruth Rendell and the P.D. James, those were a different generation and we didn't really want to write like them. We wanted to do something that was kind of more modern and a lot edgier, we thought, at the time. We were young and foolish. What do we know? Yeah, well, and Derek Raymond, the, the, the novels are, are quite singular. Uh, that 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 tone that, that Ian's talking about, it's there from the first sentence, and it's the voice of the things. You can just feel that darkness kind of moving in on you as you read through. It's definitely not to everyone's taste, but no, as I mean, writers, we are immensely attracted to that 
that's right. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it has that concision as well in very short books. Um, uh, and he lived in France a long time, Derek Raymond, and he spoke French very well. He was taken seriously as a novelist in France. I saw him on French TV on his big egghead cultural programs, and he's chatting away with his berry and his roll up cigarette and stuff. Very relaxed, very comfortable. Um, he was quite an exotic character. And the book that, of course, was, 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 was that we could have been talking about kind of here without mentioning it was I was Dora Suarez. <coughs> it's the darkest, I think, of his books, or it's about as dark as he, as he gets. And I wrote about it a few years ago in a book called, what was it called? It was like my favorite crime novel or something, or crime novels you should know. And it was edited by uh, John Connolly, uh, the Irish crime writer. And, and, and I chose I was Dora Suarez and wrote a little introduction to it. And my copy, which is like a tatty paperback, I couldn't afford hard cover books back in the 80s. Um, I, got, I got Robin, Cookie Boy we used to call him, uh, Derek Raymond to sign it, and he just signed it, Love Robin. That was it. It's, like, yeah, it's one of the darkest crime novels ever written, and in front of it just says, Love Robin, maybe even a wee kiss at the bottom, I'm not sure. About it. It's a of heart by the Yeah, quite incongruous, quite incongruous. There was another question, sorry at the back. Is there or will there be a Rebus prequel? A Rebus prequel? Probably not written by me, um, but as we know now, characters, good characters never die. Sherlock is still being reinvented, Sherlock is still being written about. Conan Doyle had no idea this character would still be getting written about after all this time. Um, you know, and Endeavour Morse, we see those, you know, Morse has come back, although his creator is long dead, and I don't think Colin Dex had any notion that someone would do a, a prequel to his books. So yeah, I mean, in the future, who knows what's going to happen. Um, it would be an interesting period in history. If we went back to Rebus when he was a younger man or a younger cop, we'd be talking about the 70s and the early 80s, which is an interesting time in Scottish political life and British political life as well. Um, David Peace has written about that period really well in his Red Riding Quartet, um, so that we could go back to that period in history, but it won't be me doing them. It won't be me doing them. Because these would be historical novels, and historical novels are really hard to write, so you've got to do all the research. <laughs> um, <laughs> we like to just make you think of, because you mentioned, you know, this research, not even researchers, but this birth of, you know, the, the girl with the dragon tattoo, that whole, I mean, my God, you know, those, those flew off the shelf, and they were coming out at the same time. What do you think about that? What do I think of what, the Scandinavian crime stories? Yeah. Or, the, or books with girl in the title? It's two very different stories. Uh, it's a sub genre. Yeah. Scandinavian, I've got, I've got some issues with Scandinavian crime fiction. I mean, we talked about Per Valor and, and Ma Ma Sherval. Uh, I was privileged to get to interview her. I've interviewed her at the Edinburgh Book Festival and then also was on a panel with her at a festival in Bergen in Norway. She's a wonderful woman. And they were a, an amazing team of writers who wrote 10 books about the changing face of crime. Uh, and society in Sweden in the 60s and the 70s, 10 really short novels, the Martin Beck series. And then he died and that was the end of that. Um, but yeah, the Scandinavian crime novel, I love those and I like some of the Bollander books. Um, uh, and again, I got to interview uh, the author of those at the Edinburgh, crime, uh, Edinburgh Book Festival once, um, Henny Mankell, uh, who was married to Ingmar Bergman's daughter. So really? Ingmar Bergman, the Swedish film director, was his oh. father-in-law, and they'd sit and watch movies and go on holiday and stuff, and go, what? Uh, and <laughs> Henning Mankell was also the head of the National Theatre of Zimbabwe, no, Zimbabwe, you know, Tanzania or somewhere, like somewhere in Africa, and go, what? Some life. Um, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, no, I mean, well, just recently, just recently, bloody Yo Nesbo, Norwegian, writes Macbeth, he updates Macbeth as a crime novel. And one of the reviews in the, one of the first reviews in the UK said, um, there surely could be no writer better than Neil Nesbo to update Macbeth. I thought, well, apart from every single Scottish crime writer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not called the Scottish play for nothing. Give <laughs> it to Neil Nesbo. I believe it. Anyway, so I've got some issues there. Um, <laughs> But you know, but it's, they're, they're definitely whenever crime fiction is talked about internationally, the Scottish writers and the Scandinavian writers are often put together. And when we get we get put together on panels and stuff, and we always get, well, bless you, we always seem to get on well. Um, there is that kind of sense of the darkness, the kind of moral, quite gothic stories, uh, big moral centres, dark countries, cold countries, um, and crimes that fit that scenario. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, uh, books with a girl on title, that's a different thing altogether. Yeah.
And, uh, you know, I keep threatening to call my next Rebus novel the, the girl anything. Just, just call it anything the girl. Anything the girl in the floor set. Jim, what are you working on just now? I thought you'd never. By the way, his last novel, Will Not, I, I just thought was an extraordinary piece of work. It's one of my favourite books ever about American small towns. It's not, it's not a, a crime novel per se, I wouldn't have said. No. There's a mystery there, but that's not the central no. focus. Well, it started off as a crime novel, but I couldn't figure out what had happened, so... I, <laughs> 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 I have three books coming out. Um, one of them is, uh, I have, uh, wrote a book about uh, <coughs> some old paperback novelist called Difficult Lives, which has been out of print. It's coming back into print with a lot of introductions, including one on Derek Raymond and others, which will be coming out, uh, I think, in March or so. Uh, the, I have a fifth poetry collection coming out next year, and I also have a new novel, which will be coming out from Soho, and it's called Sarah Jane. It's the second novel I've written from a female point of view, which I really, really love to do. And again, it's like well done. It's not really a crime novel, but it is about uh, a, a, a female sheriff who just kind of, after a, a third of the book, uh, wandering through an awful life and being a terrible person, actually turns into quite a good one. And again, this is not autobiographical. I just made all of this up. <laughs> Did you say Soho Press? Soho Press? Juliet, why didn't you tell me you were going to publish Jim Salas? You haven't announced it yet. I guess this is the official announcement. So this was the first. <laughs> yes. How exciting. When, when is it scheduled to publish? November 2019. Oh. It's crazy good. Of course it is. Well, you have to say that. Well, on that happy note, I want to thank Jim for coming, and Ian as well. And if you guys will take about 10 minutes, um, let's convene for unconventional women, and we'll wrap up right around 3 o'clock. Let's give them both a round of applause. Good job. We do have a few copies that will not over there if you'd like to catch the very elusive